From the art of the deal to keeping it real. Keeping it real. Live from the Simply Vegas studios, it's the Power Move with John Gafford. Back again. Back again, back again, back again. It's another episode of the Power Move. My name is John Gafford. I am your host to the left of me as always in, I'm just telling you right now, guys, if you have never watched this on YouTube, if you've never liked and subscribed, put a towel for no other seat. reason, <laughs> you got to go on and check out this jacket the cold is rocking because my man, that is a like it? deep tartan. That is, that's a solid, <laughs> solid tartan jacket. I'm jealous. Appreciate it. it. Appreciate it. So as always, welcome to the Bulgarian mongoose. How are you, buddy? Doing well. Doing, Doing well. well. The Doing podcaster, well. formerly known as the Green Bubble. Yes, the green, the green bubble, the fo- formerly known as the Green Bubble, back oh, as the Bulgarian God, mongoose. I still regret that decision. No, Seriously. no, you can't. Yes, I we, do. We love you. iPhone for sucks. It. Everyone loves no, you for it. We, cold. Love you for it. We, we totally love you for Worst it. Phone ever. Also in the studio, as always, Chris, the counselor. Connell, how are you, sir? Living the dream. Seven hundred two law for all your legal needs. Seven hundred two Connell. So we got seven hundred two. Ro- can I ask you a question? Cool. Mm. I got to ask a question. I Just, copied. Did you did yeah, you copy because you because you started yeah. the roofing company? On this, you, yep. Colt also now owns a roofing company, and he's seven hundred two roofing. You're welcome. And now there's seven hundred two Connell. Connell, one day I'll tell the story. <laughs> one day I'll tell the story of how I got that phone number for free. Yeah, for I'm free? trying to get roofing. All it cost me was a Walmart burner phone and like eighteen <laughs> hours of calls to like the Philippines, Sri Lanka. <laughs> Um, really, I had to wait for some. I feel like this is also the story how you got hardcore German pornography, but I'm just telling that. No, 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 that <laughs> same, similar, same, similar, different similar search, different, 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 different search. Different search with okay. Same difficulty, different same search difficulty, terms. Difficulty, different search. I get it. And with the Sue is probably already regretting his choice very quickly as he's sitting in the seat next to us. We have a local business here that is really, um, it, it, look, man, you're going to hear the word local business and you're going to think, great, now they're rolling in like the, the knitting club. That's No, that's not it. No, no. On this show, no, if this is your up. first time joining us or you've listened to us, to us before, this is where we talk about business, things to make you better, things of those things, and we believe success leaves clues. So we like to talk to people that are successful. And this is a business that has taken Las Vegas, dare I say, by storm. I would dare say it. Dare say by storm. I mean, everybody I know just about, I mean, literally, as we're walking back here to the studio, as we're walking into the studio, one of our guys that has worked for us forever goes, hey, is that, is that the dude that owns Foodie Fit? <laughs> I go, I go, yeah, it is. And he goes, man, I get, I, and he stops him and he goes, I get 95% of my meals from this place. And then he's, and this is a, and, and by the way, the guy that was talking to you is not, not no joke. He's a seven figure agent. He makes a ton of money. He does well. So when he says, I want to invest, he's dead serious. And he's got the quant. So, <laughs> so that's, that's not one of those. Oh, thank you so much, sir. Move on. That's like, a, okay, let me get your number. And I'll call you in a couple months. And he's fit too. Yeah, so and he's it wasn't fit. like uh, yeah, no, no, no. So it was fit. So I, I didn't know if it was scripted or not. No, it no. really, just boosts no. my ego as I walk in. No, no, no. It, it, it really, it really was not. Cues we should do that now. Number one. We're like, no, it's, it, 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 Somebody really, else it, it really was not. But Andrew, who owns Foodie Fit, is in, and we're going to talk about his story, um, some of the things that he has done to build a very, very successful brand that is now looking to expand into many other markets. So as you grow, we're, we're going to be able to look back at this podcast and say, man, I bet he regrets that now, five <laughs> years later, is what we're going to be able to say, uh, five years time. So we're looking forward to that. He's charging 25000 an hour for you <laughs> but, know, consulting gigs. Yeah. But, but before, as we always do, let's talk about kind of the current events and some news that are going on to make us not evergreen. So the first wow. thing I want to talk about that I thought Pete. was- what was Pete. it? What are you talking Pete, about? Pete and Kim. People, oh, is that oh, not Pete. what you're excited for? Okay, oh, seriously. Sorry, no, okay, John, first of all, uh, no, 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 we can talk about that because <laughs> I will <laughs> say. Right. I cried over it for the weekend. Is this not the first guy. dude that has escaped the Kardashians with his career intact? I think Smart he had. Move. I think he out Kardashian'd the Kardashians. The Kardashians. I, think I was he thinking did. that the other day. I think I thought this guy actually came out ahead. I think he sucked some of their fame and yeah. now he's Good better for him. it. Playing chess. He's playing right. chess over All here. right, seriously, though. All right, let me ask you a question. If Pete Davidson was to write a book, mm-hmm. right, called How to Satisfy a Woman in Bed. I feel like I could smell it. How many of those could he sell? Because <laughs> obviously you look at that dude and you look at the women that he's dated, he's got something. Just rockets, but like I said, he could. I could smell the book. It should be a scratch and sniff. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I may or yeah. may not buy it. No, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. It. it just doesn't seem like a good idea. So yeah, there was that. The thing that caught my eye this week that I thought was pretty amazing was, did you guys hear there was a Chick-fil-A somewhere? I don't even remember where it was. But they were trying to hire people, not as employees, but as volunteers to help them work their drive through And they would pay them for every hour they worked with five free meals. Which Literally, I, we'll I work did, for food as a business I, model. 
saw that, <laughs> and it's actually not that bad. <laughs> How is it According not According to the Fair Labor Standards yeah. Act? Yeah, no, go knock out yeah. two hours, you feed your oh family. Oh, my God. <laughs> For somebody not making money, I mean, Well, there's not, a way that like they can in this room, employees right? with currency. Okay. Yeah, I'd rather. Right. Sometimes, nah. But t- this, t- today when I went to, a, de- today when I went to a, a deposition at a, an attorney's office that was literally in a, in a, in a, in a ga- well, not a gas station, it was a car wash. Nail As salon. I stopped at the gas station over off of Nellis, wherever I was, to get some gas. Oh, nice. And there was, I, there was a dude at the gas station there offering to clean my windshield. Obviously, he was a homeless nice. fellow, and it was, you know, it was nice enough about him. But that would be the extent of... The gas station saying, "I'll give you a gallon of gas for every ten windshields you wash." Yeah, I mean, no, there are literal laws against barter. Yeah, there are literal laws to protect this. I was, literally, it's not surprising that you think this is. And, a good Andrew, you ever try to barter with your clients? <laughs> just straight barter, not like oh, as a as a supplementary bonus, our employees yeah. get X amount of meals with their. Well, I mean, um, you've helped us for food before, so. <laughs> well, See? again, yeah, but, <laughs> he's easy. But I'm, 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 an ex- I'm exempt under Fair Labor Standards Act. <laughs> oh my god, I'm an well, exempt. Don't you love when people barter, though? I love barter. I, I barter is wonderful. I, no, I love barter that. makes it. I'm not around. slagging barter, but it, when it's talking about feeding your family no, to work to volunteer just, window at a I, minimum I, wage same job. Same difference, yeah. though. If you're working to feed your family, if you go knock out two hours, and they're giving you thirty dollars worth of food. What's the but, matter? But and not you're not thir- paying taxes. But it's well, not, they're not, it's not paying thirty dollars worth, worth of food. food. It's it's four eight dollars worth, worth of food. Well, you know what's actually funny <laughs> is they they have something called the Tendy Index, which actually tracks the price of chicken, flour, oil, basically things that make a chicken tender. <laughs> and uh, I swear <laughs> to God, this is a real thing. <laughs> and so actually, right now on the Tendy Index. Uh, <laughs> Chicken tenders are more expensive than they've ever been. Is this an actual index? An actual index. So maybe Colt, cool. maybe I'm, I'm going to walk it back. I think, I think if you Colt broke it the down, the index. index. <laughs> yeah. we, is that going to be, uh, since we're getting rid of LIBOR, I believe, right? I think we're just going to the Tendi index. Maybe we go Tendi <laughs> index. I, I think it's like a CPI basket index. Or something. CPI basket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, some people want the gold standard back. I don't. That ship has sailed. That's yeah. Some people want to use Bitcoin. I think you're out of your absolute mind. Absolute mind. But the Tendi index, I'm listening. Yes. We got me. It's a commodity. It's a commodity. This, yeah. Because look, look. if you look at Forex, future exchanges, you took it pig bellies, orange juice, or whatever, flour, chicken, oil, those are all pretty, you know. I like yeah. it. Pretty great. I actually fungible, like it. Can, can I ask you a quick, can you, can you hear the phrase talking about trading pork bellies and not think of trading places? Never, no. Ever? <laughs> Ever? Pork bellies. No, you just, it's impossible, It's impossible. Right? It's impossible. There's no way. I was at a at a Korean barbecue and they had pork bellies and I almost <laughs> did my best Dan Aykroyd. <laughs> That's it. So. Oh, sure. Like he went to Harvard. There it is. All right. Well, enough of this nonsense. Andrew, let's get to you. So first of all, <laughs> first like for the for the three people still listening, yep. thank you for still being here. Uh, we will, for, but I'm going to give you a little incentive. So if you hang out long enough, at the end of the show, we will do five questions into the mind of Colt, which has become honestly <sighs> my <laughs> favorite part of this show now, because it just allows us to dive deep into the anomaly, the enigma, abyss. the mystery, the I don't abyss. I think I've said anything bad. Called. I think that <laughs> most people you mean really eating humans for sport, not hunting, eating, eating humans. No, hunting, hunting, just hunting, hunting humans. For so sport. you're even going to waste the meat. That's. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you this weird question. But if you had a chance to try human meat, Chris, oh, I feel like you would do it. Oh I feel like Chris would do it. Chris, that's actually Foodie Fit's number one. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> that's a number one combo. It's just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Oh my god, Connell, right. if you had a chance, would you? No, <laughs> Colt. We've, we've already gone over this. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna help you hide bodies by consuming them. Just oh my god! All right, so Andrew, <laughs> tell us about you, my butt, my man. Where did you? Uh, where did you grow up? Where did you start out? Yeah, so I'm originally from San Diego. Uh, I went to school in Santa Barbara, the, the classic entrepreneur, you know, kind of. Uh, route dropout of uh, college, you know how that goes. I uh, was a business major, uh, economics, and uh, didn't go all the way through with that. Ended up working for a, some nightclub in Santa Barbara where I met my now business partner and at the time was my roommate. Anyways, as time goes on, I ended up moving to Vegas because that's kind of the next natural progression in the nightclub hospitality. Sure. Right. Mm-hmm. And I uh, I thought you were going there with how beautiful San Diego, San Barbara, and then Vegas. Yeah. Uh, you were going to lose me on that one. But well, yeah. I, you know, I, see, here's the thing. I want to go back a little further, though, because here's the thing. Entrepreneurs and people that are high level entrepreneurs all have similar traits, I think. What we found through this show is kids. What was your first hustle as a kid to make money? 
Well, outside of the normal lemonade stand, we used to go paint addresses on sidewalks. So we just knock on someone's doorstep, uh-huh. get five bucks, and you know, offer to paint their address. Stencil on there. it on there, buddy. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Uh huh. I've heard that hustle before. I've never heard of that one. You never no, heard that? Yeah, that's a good that one. Hustle. And that's one that anybody can do. That literally, I like that. spray paint stencil. Anyone can do that. Make it easier for the Amazon driver, for the Uber driver, for whatever else. Well, the Grubhub, you at, lazy at bastards. At the time, the pitch was uh, we would go into kind of older neighborhoods. Like, if, what if you need an ambulance, right? You're getting older. You know, you fall. Because mm-hmm. uh, at the time, Amazon uh, wasn't really a thing. wasn't a whole lot of deliveries. So, we'd, you know, it was more like for like, oh, you know, emergency <laughs> and, services. And how old were you? How old was this when you are doing this? Oh, I mean, pre-driving, uh, you know, probably 12, 12? 10. Yeah. But you it had was you and who, it was just you by yourself, or it was my, myself and uh, we had a friend named Scott that I used to do it with. Okay, um, and then when I was actually real young, and in retrospect, looking back at it, uh, it, it was very similar to your Chick Fil A. Uh, I used to work at my dad's store, so my dad was an entrepreneur as well. He had a couple businesses, and he used to pay me two bucks an hour to work in his store as a kid. And at the time, I thought that was great money. And sure. in retrospect, I. See, he was taking advantage Slave of me. Labor. <laughs> sure. Were you making Nikes? Is that what you were doing? Yeah. It's a statute of limitations, Andrew. We can yeah. talk about it later. The statute of limitations it, it is, uh, is over. So who came up with the sidewalk hustle? Um, I think it was we more or less just stole it. More or less. I mean, like you we just saw, saw somebody yeah, doing it. Yeah, we saw doing it. That's a good did. idea. Like, why are we not doing that? Yeah. Um, you know, so we so we do that on the weekends and summers, things like that. Save them enough money to, you know, go buy some toys and get into trouble. Um, and that, that was kind of the first thing we did. To kind of make some side cash, but my first what was your act- first job. What was the first Ooh. job that you had? Well, actually, they're out of business now, so I think it's okay to say. So uh, <laughs> I was 14, <laughs> and I worked full time on over the summer at a fuel dock. We used to fill up these big fishing boats with fuel. I'm 14 years old, and these are like fuel pump. Yeah, the big that- industrial three, four gallons a second of diesel. <laughs> and it's not like a, like a normal gas station where they shut off. They had to listen to it. But if you leave it on, like. 30 seconds too long. You have a geyser of 200 gallons of diesel in the air. All over you. Oh my God. It's horrible. Um, you know, and I remember at one point, I'm 14 years old and we used to have to crush oil filters in this big hydraulic press press. And I'm sitting there trying to put them in and the thing crushes, trying to take one out. It was something yeah. out of like 19. Yeah, like can somebody call OSHA? Era. Like this place is out of business, yeah. but our, I feel like our, they could do a retroactive. Our field manager Stumpy <laughs> was really helpful in training me. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? You could not do that. Lord. Oh yeah, you oh. could not do that. A for just standards, but B kids are so dumb at fourteen anymore. <laughs> I know. So are you, saying, are, are, are you saying that? that kids would be incapable of doing something because they would just de facto be injured with every transaction twenty years later? I, I think that kid, no, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not arguing with you. But I think kids nowadays, a fourteen year old is not the same as a fourteen year old now. Twenty five years ago, yeah. I, saw, yeah. I saw somebody somebody posted like a a meme or something, and it said like. Uh, why not to mess with people over 42? And it was like, these people apparently were like, they had some skill set they needed by the age two. They knew how to cook meals by age five. They had a key to the house by seven, by nine. They left the house in the morning and didn't come back for the rest of the day. All they drank was out of a garden hose. Yeah, the Maybe they got a sandwich if somebody's mom in the neighborhood happened to go to the grocery <laughs> store when they were there. They might have got a sandwich. They're like, yeah, these are the real people, not to sc- These are the real screw around, see what happened, people. Some real psychos. <laughs> <are>. <laughs> now I'm seeing my son would be locked out of the house for like 20 minutes and be like, oh, I'm Freaking starting. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whose anyway, fault is that, though? Right? Yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll take some responsibility. That's <laughs> true. It is. It strong is. times. It is strong. Men make easy no, times. Dude, well, you know, I, I'll say that he, he is he is a little tougher now. We just in, in high school now, which is crazy to me. That's you guys nuts. started yet? You started high school? Yeah. No. Next week. Next week. It's crazy. Crazy when you see him off to high school. It's nuts. So speaking of high school, you're done with high school. Now you're. We, let's go back to college now. So. Obviously, the institution had nothing further to offer you, which I think is a story that most entrepreneurs, me included, uh, can uh, can appreciate. <laughs> well, it was, it was actually kind of a freak accident. So I used to ride motorcycles, and I got T-boned uh, when I was on my motorcycle, and that kind of put me out of commission for quite a while. Mm-hmm. Um, and kind of coming back into that, I was you know eighty thousand dollars in in debt from that incident. Um, I was like, man, I really need to get back to school, but I also really need to work because I was kind of supporting myself through college, uh, and so. It was like kind of, well, do I take classes? Do I go work? I was like, I'll take two classes and I'll, I'll work full time. Uh, and then two classes turned into no classes and kind of just ended up working. Um, and, you know, at, at, at the end of that, I was like, I need, I need more. And if Where were you working? At, where, you were, where were you working? What were you doing? Uh, I was like a bar lead at a, at a little cantina in Santa Barbara. It. Um, it was fun. Don't get me wrong. You know, yeah. being, being a 
bartender in a bar town is like a celebrity. Oh, it's the yeah. best. It's yeah. Great. It's the, uh, it's a few years my future wife will never know about. Um, <laughs> you know, great, great time. But I knew, I knew in order to progress in kind of hospitality, you know, Vegas was the next logical yeah. step. So I kind of put the feelers out and, you know, made my way out to Vegas, somehow leaving the beach and coming to this hot, <laughs> dry desert. <laughs> logical progression. Smart progress. move. Yeah, move. Smart move. Smart move. <laughs> So you're in Vegas now. What what year is this you moved here? Uh, 2010. 2010. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good times. For and, real estate, uh, right? I, so I, I worked for one of the resorts on the strip for seven years. Got hired on as a bartender originally. Kind of worked my way up to a bar lead into management, uh, into an operation management role. Um, but I, I'm not a big drinker. I was never really a party one. You know, wanted to go out and party. I'm kind of an introvert. Mm -hmm. And so the one thing that I was always kind of in a pinch for was was food. I worked, you know, five, six to sometimes seven days a week at the win. And, uh, oops. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Well, we'll, we'll edit that out. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but you did. I mean, there's nothing wrong with yeah, that. Yeah. Wrong you know, with that. I, well, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a workhorse. So that's kind of all I've known. Like I had my first full-time job when I was 14. Yeah. In, in, in uh, Andrew's defense, I've never actually heard you besmirch the good name of the wind. No. Hotel. So it's not like I'm well, well, to worry about. If, if there's any room you don't want to do that with, it's this one being Sal Colt is a shareholder. A one share. He has one share of the win. About one share of the win. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry they missed earnings today. Well, he's, yeah, his one, me, sh one, his one share. This morning. His one share yeah. not doing well. Anyways. He's, I'm getting murdered in the market. <laughs> yes. yeah, getting murdered down murdered. three dollars. So you're working for Colt at the win. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what happens then? Yeah. So I mean, I, I to be honest, I loved it. I, I love the culture there. Um, but I'm not one to party, and I, I was always in a pinch for food, and so. At the time, my, my best friend was working for a company that did meal prep out in California. I was like, man, we really need this like grocery store concept where I can just go in, grab meals off the shelf um, because I don't cook. I think I've probably cooked three meals in the past 10 years. I just, I, I don't Something do it. future done. wife also doesn't <laughs> want to do, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy dishes. I, and so I kind of, we kind of thought of this idea like, well, maybe we can reach out to this company, get the franchise rights and open up the model here. They said no. So he said, Screw it. We'll, we'll do it ourselves. <laughs> do our own. So, so <laughs> having whoops. no idea really how this operated, obviously you're coming out of the bar business. Mm -hmm. So you're figuring you understand food, you understand liquor costs, you understand bar costs, you understand labor. Mm -hmm. I guess you pretty much, if you got that down, you just applied to the food costs and the same metrics is in the same, uh, the same cogs, everything, everything applies. Same yeah. Thing. Yeah. And I think, I think understanding business fundamentals from a nightclub uh, perspective is easy because the metrics are really easy to understand, right? It's how much does each person spend? You know, what's, what's the head count? You know, it's very simple metrics. Yeah. There's no logistics, supply chains to deal with things like that. And so, uh, moving Bar and liquor days and shipments yeah. though can be a pain. Like you, you miss a, a keg shipment for your, I, honestly, just working yeah. in bars. That was the only time that was applicable. Yeah. Well, the, the biggest problem with bars is somebody's always stealing. Yeah. <laughs> somebody's oh, yeah. Yeah. always like, I don't care how good you are at running a bar. You're getting stolen. There's, from. there's, there's breakage everywhere sure. yeah. through overpour, through skimming, through just not ringing stuff. I mean, it's, it's called everywhere. relationship management. Yeah, exactly. John. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So anyway, so you understand that. And so you're not going to get your franchise. You're just going to start this out. So, okay. So let's, let's walk all the way through the, the building of foodie fit. What year was this? So this was in 2016 okay. and we, we kind of developed the, the, the model and, and part of it is I have a business partner who is one of the most incredible salespeople I've ever met in my life. He moved to Vegas and within a year had a key to the city. Um, he's an extrovert. He's great at connecting people. He's like that guy that has a guy for everything. Yeah. Um, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, and, yeah. and I think actually Love that, he, yep. yeah, that's how I, I that's got, how connected we got connected with, with. Uh, yep. Chris was, Alex met somebody who got referred to him and then Amy Lee, shout out to Paleo Angel. Yeah, yeah. yeah there you go. Um, and so we had basically kind of the same. Amy Ma, Amy Ma, sorry, Alex Lee, Amy Ma. Yeah. It was the Lee Ma connection. <laughs> um, so, so, so we had like kind of the marketing sales side. You're ruining the podcast. You're ruining it. Stop. <laughs> Just trying to get Ruining props the podcast. <laughs> ruining it. <laughs> Jesus. Um, and, and so the only part we were actually missing was kind of a, a, the, the kitchen aspect. And so we are kind of interviewing chefs and, and talking to people, and we couldn't really find anybody to execute our vision of, of what we wanted out of can, the food. Can I, can I go back just a little bit, though? So let me ask you a question. So you, who developed the actual business plan? M me. Okay. Was it a written business plan? Was it 30 pages, 50 pages, 20 pages, 10 pages? Was it? Five. Five. 
So five pages. Mm -hmm. So the reason I think this is so important and the reason I want to mention this is because I think when people go to start a business, they go online and they read, what do I need for a business plan? And then there's this like executive summary that's nonsense. And then there's just all of this filler that's nothing. And I'm here to tell you as somebody that has invested in a lot of, a lot of companies, when I look at a business plan, I just want to really see the numbers, the vision, and I want to, and I want to understand the drive of the founders. Outside of that, it's all noise. So I love that your plan was only five pages. I love that. So were you guys going to bootstrap this up? Were you self funded? Did you go look for outside investors? What did you do? So, you know, I, I'm, I'm a very frugal person by nature. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I was making good money what I was doing. So I had some money saved up. Uh, same thing with Alex. And so, you know, our, our, our original idea was just to self fund. Um, we had enough to kind of get a small business going, but we couldn't find a chef. And so, I'm actually not the original founder of the company, believe it or not. Uh, so we ended up trying to find a chef, couldn't find anybody. And so we said, you know, maybe there's somebody out there already doing this that we can jump on with who could use our help, mine and operations, Alex and sales and marketing. Uh. And so what we did is we started ordering food from every meal prep company, every private chef in town and just started trying food. And we ended up ordering food from this company called Ninja Fit Meals. Um, and this guy Bo made it and had someone drop it off and we tried it and it was so far beyond what anybody was doing. We just approached and said, we want you for our model. This is what we want to do. And Bo at the time, I think I had like two employees, like, no, I have my own company. I don't, I don't <laughs> need anybody. And I said, well, what would it take for you to get over here? No, no, I have my own company. I don't want you. Yeah. And so we said, okay, let us buy into your company. You're a chef, uh, you know, by, by trade, you went to culinary school. You used to you know, work in the world of gourmet, took a step back to do this healthy cooking thing. Like, let us help you or you can get back to your roots and just cook. Because at the time he was kind of getting to the point where he kind of had to do a little marketing and how to do customer service and all these other things that he didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. And so we actually, I, I, to this day, I kind of joke around. We overpaid for his company by a lot. Sure. Um, you know, I think we paid like 50 grand for 66% of it, which was way but, overpaying. But see, but see again. But okay. we wanted him. But, but, the, but the, this is, dude, this is going to be like a master Shout class. Shout out to here. Chef Boba. This is like a master class <laughs> in what you do. Because, for, for example, as you're walking in and one of my guys says, oh, my God, I love your product. I want to buy in. Well, he wants to buy in because he knows the product because the product is now successful. If you want to do what you did, what you've got to do is, like you said, try everything and find the diamond in the rough and find the guy that is the best roofer in the world that has no idea how to run a business. Yep. And then you come in and say, look, you just got to be a good roofer and I'll handle all the business, which mm -hmm. is essentially what Colt has done. Yep. Right. Exactly. So if you want to, sometimes the, the easiest and best way, I love that you said that I'm not even the founder, the best and easiest way to start a successful business is not to start one. It's to find one that's underperforming for reasons that you can solve there because they lack in, they lack in the places where you are strong. That's right. a great way to say it, John. Yeah. For the way, not, not, not chasing down insolvent concepts that are no. going downhill, right? No, right? No. Because what <laughs> I've heard of some really crazy stuff where people are like, no, no, I can revitalize it. No, no. But it's to say, okay, this thing is solvent. It's not that it was insolvent. It's not that it's going anywhere. It's just stagnant. Yeah, it's not growing they because, because they don't different. know how to do it. They were in City Athletic Club. They were in a couple different places. Mm -hmm. The concept was there. And I remember eating it at City Athletic Club, but it was just sort of a one-off. I, I couldn't have remembered the name if you yeah. told me. I only found out the name way after the fact. Yeah. Right. And I think a lot See? of business owners let their egos kill it, right? Like I know a restaurant in town that is grossing more than anybody. They are killing it, mm -hmm. and but they are leaving so much meat on the bone because they just will not take any outsider in. No consulting. Yeah, maybe they don't no want to. I mean, there's... It, no, it's not that they don't want to. They truly think that they got they're it. doing it right, and they they're just it. bleeding left and right. But they're making so much money, like the bear on it. Hulu. Yeah. So, that? so let me let me ask you let me ask you a question now. All right, all things being considered, as to where you are now with the company, you say you overpaid for it. How much more would you pay for it now? <laughs> no, no. If you knew the outcome was where you are today, I bet you would have paid four times more than fifty grand. I mean probably knowing the outcome and, but that's if kind you, of the thing though but is, you don't know the outcome right, right. So. well it's kind of one of those things where by himself you know that single component it wasn't worth that much even with just him and me it probably wasn't worth that much with him myself and alex who does the marketing and sales that's the synergy that works right yeah. that's what actually made it work was the fact that we all have such different personalities different talents different temperaments i mean we bicker like old married couple mm -hmm. um but it, but it's great you know and and that's really what has pushed us forward is we all know what we're good at we all stick with what we're good at 
and we consult everybody else because we, I, I know I can go to Alex, but I suck at sales, man. I, I, this person wants to do this collaboration with us. I can't close this deal. I need you to jump in for me. Mm -hmm. And he'll be like, great, I got this. And just like with him, he's, I have this crazy idea. Will it work? I'll sit there and crunch the numbers and be like, no, right? And so like we, and, and, and we don't hold that <laughs> against each work. other. Yeah, just, <laughs> right? well, that's great partnership. Well, well, so, you, yeah, you some, preach that all the time. So many partnerships have, fall apart because- They partner it, with the same- They partner with themselves. Yeah. Can you like, say who you guys partner with now? Uh, as far as like influencers like, or like local influencers, major organizations. Oh yeah. Well, so like the, the last big partnership that we actually uh, did is we are the official sponsor for the Raiderettes. Um, so that, that's like the last, I guess, big sponsorship that, that we, that we picked up. And, you know, looking back five years ago when we were doing, you know, like a thousand meals a week, maybe like the fact right. that like we're that yeah. we're how, getting that high. Major NFL. How, how many yeah. meals are you doing right now? Uh, I think last month we did somewhere in the realm of around 120,000. <laughs> Jesus. So aver averaging between three, 4,000 a day. Okay. Mm. All right. So let's get back to Chef Bo. Because <laughs> I got to know how we go from Chef Bo, we're going to give you too much money to get in where we have a, a production facility capable of doing that type of business on a fresh product, yeah. non-frozen. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that is, uh, that's quite, that's quite the journey. And we're, and this is, so what's the time frame on that? What's the timeline on us? Five years? So that was five years ago. Yeah. Actually, we just celebrated <laughs> five our five year anniversary okay. uh, last month. Okay. Good for you guys. So awesome. one of my favorite things, if you're listening to this right now and you're thinking, I can't get shit done, you literally have no excuse. This is pretty <laughs> amazing. So let's go back to, uh, to this. So Chef Bo agrees, you overpay for him. You've got it. You're using his commissary, his two guys to start out. Mm hmm so tiny, what comes tiny kitchen so what 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 comes first obviously you like the product is it let's start driving sales and then we'll staff to the sales or do we staff before we drove sales so the the kind of first thing that we had to do is really pick apart the business and pick apart the books and and do a, a full audit and what yeah. we kind of found out was in some cases he was actually selling food for less than he was than it cost him to make it he was losing money um and again he wasn't a business person he's a yeah. brilliant chef yeah not you know, he was, I think he had missed some tax payments and he, you know, didn't have his, you know, finances in line. So the first thing was like, well, we need to figure out where we're bleeding money first. Cause if I drive sales and I'm selling food for less than it costs me to make it. <laughs> it doesn't then, matter. Then, then, yeah, yeah. then yeah. it doesn't matter. Right. So Yay, I'm increasing the loss every day. Exactly. Right. And so <laughs> we, uh, we kind of had to plug the holes first and, and we knew we were going to rebrand. And so we kind of almost used uh, Ninja Fit Meals name as, as a testing ground because we just said, you know what, the first year, money isn't the currency, information and data is the currency. And so for the first six months, we basically rotated the menu every single week, went off the wall with dishes, just tried things, got tons of feedback, uh, reformulated the model, reformulated the, the, the recipes. Um, so the really the first six months, it was just it was just a learning curve. Well, that let's back let's back up and talk about that. So when you say the first, the first year we're about sales are about data and learning. How much were you guys prepared to lose in that first year? How much going into it? Did you say, okay, look, we're going to look at this as, a, as an investment in the product an investment, in our future. What is the number we're willing to swallow for, for, for year one? Right. So, so part of the deal in, in buying in was that we would provide essentially a safety net capital, um, you know, and it was somewhere in the realm of, I think, $80,000. Okay. Um, and we were, we were on track to lose that. I mean, we were losing one to $2,000 a week. Um, so he was bleeding slow. It wasn't like a, he, oh, yeah. he's still well, bleeding. It's small overhead though. The, yeah. the, the, his shop was only 900 square feet, you know, with two employees yeah. and we weren't paying ourselves yet, which was, you know, half the staff. Yep. Uh, so, so yeah, we weren't, we weren't bleeding, but we were, where we were bleeding was just trying new things, right? All the food we we're having to buy for R and D and we were delivering seven days a week. And sometimes we only had like one or two people on, on a route for deliveries and they're on mm -hmm. opposite sides of town. So just to get the food to the customer losing tons of money on. Yeah. And, uh, but, but it was such a good learning opportunity because what we found out was, well, it's not just like a bunch of bodybuilders and fitness gurus that we're catering to. It's, it is busy, real normal people, agents, you know, or doctors, lawyers, like th those young professionals and, and people that are just busy, but want to eat healthy. And so that was really our, our chance to kind of tweak the brand, if you will, and, and change the menu development concept to kind of cater to that, that, that niche of, of people. Mm -hmm. So it, it was, it was great. You know, that learning. So you go through the first year, you get all your data, you understand where you're going and you've, you've narrowed it down. Obviously just from the model of delivery, I would say, so your problems probably were going through, we're getting food costs in line, pricing the property properly, pricing the pricing 
You the can product what, properly. You can tell what industry John works in. <laughs> right? like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pricing the property properly. Well, yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. <laughs> but getting getting the getting getting the right price on things was probably mm -hmm. tough. And then I'm guessing the second problem was probably going to be logistics because mm -hmm. how do you figure that out? Yeah. So I mean, when we first started, you know, we we were trying to, you know, go as bare bones as possible. So our even our route like our routing software was horrible. We're using like this app that's that was made for road trips. <laughs> Like, you know, like mapping out how to get Map to people's quest. house, right? Um, you know, now it's a little bit more complicated, but at the, at the time we were said, okay, what's a, what's a, what's, how will we not bleed, you know, as fast? And so, um, and at the time too, my, my girlfriend at the time was like, I never see you. You, you, you leave before I wake up, you get home after I go to bed. I never see you. I'm just going to start coming to the office with you and helping out. I'm like, Hop great. On board. <laughs> yeah, great. Threaten me Perfect. with free labor. Yeah, yeah, yeah great. <laughs> Can you make Nike tennis shoes? <laughs> Come on down. <laughs> You know, and she's actually a huge asset because she's she has a great attention to detail. And so for the first you know kind of year, she worked side by side with us as well. And uh, so you know the, the the problems in the beginning were really kind of just figuring out what it you know the model right. And so there's like standard ways to to run a restaurant right. There's mm -hmm. a kind of a operating manual of how restaurants typically run or how to run a real estate you know agency. But when you come into kind of such a new business model, there's no kind of standard way of operating. So one of the hardest things to figure out was, well, how do you actually operate this business? Yeah. Um, and that was a lot of trial and error. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it took us probably a good, I would say year and a half, two years to kind of develop to even to where we are now um, to kind of get a point to a point where we said, okay, yeah, this is kind of what the model looks like. I would think with three people involved like that, right? I would think that there would be some ego bruising during that period. Like, I'm going to come up with this idea, we should do it this way. And then it's all of a sudden like that this ain't working or it doesn't work. Was everybody pretty flexible through that time? Did everybody understand the need for flexibility? Because this is that that's also what you just said is one of those crucial times that burns a lot of businesses down because people get so married or fall in love with their own ideas and their own process. They can't let it go when it's not working. Oh, yeah. And I think like if, if I look back at Andrew five years ago and Andrew now, two totally different people because the things I've learned through that process as far as just, you know, kind of like psychology of people and even how, how I, how myself operates. Mm -hmm. um, and in the beginning it was, we don't, we all know, knew we didn't know what we were doing. And so we were very open to everybody's ideas. You guys were incredibly open ideas. Yeah. <laughs> like carte blanche. Yeah. <laughs> Like it was just tabula rasa. Be, I love hey, it. what do you think? Yeah. And you guys were that's extremely awesome. collaborative. See, look that's at, why you're. So, that's why you get successful yeah. faster, right? Not by shutting down good ideas because it's not your idea. Yeah. Well, like, like for example, Colt, you could have recommended if the delivery driver is thirty minutes late, I get to hunt him. <laughs> if I, <laughs> I if I kill him, paintball. <laughs> if I kill him, then I get to <laughs> buy food for free. <laughs> that could have been on Thursdays, like a uh, special. Many, Some pugilistic Fridays. How many uh, <laughs> meals do you think you could get out of the average human body? Jeez. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, well, so anyway, I've done the math. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to, back to reality. The, what it's a, equivalent of 600 chicken tenders. Right. Oh, gross. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to what's, your, what's your demographics for that kind of stuff? Like, uh, it always intrigues me because, um, you know, I, I would always think your demographics were certain sex, certain age, certain uh income and i feel like vegas is just throws those out the window i feel like you know you got people lower uh, income that still are eating healthy like that do you find that in vegas or is there a pretty set demographic you deal with yeah i mean well, one of the nice things is is everybody needs to eat right and so everybody is a potential customer there there's you know maybe the bottom earners in vegas where it might be priced out of their you know a little bit out of their, out of their price range um, you know, so we're less than a restaurant, maybe a little more than a grocery store. Uh, so most of our consumers, we, we skew actually slightly female, uh, as far as our current customer base, huh. but, but it, yeah. And I would not have thought that. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, uh, hang out at their stores. It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> I would have thought that, but I'd have thought it would have been a big gap between female and male. No, it, it just, it's, it's, it slightly skews female. Um, but it's really just anybody from, you know, 21 to, I think the starts to maybe to downtrend a little bit after 40, but even people in the re, you know, retirement ages, we still have a really strong showing for yeah. it. Wow. Um, are you guys, are you guys actually priced more than grocery? Cause I swear to God, I've, I've looked at some things and you look at the price per meal. What's your average price per meal? Like eight ninety nine, nine ninety nine. Nine bucks, yeah. Yeah. Nine bucks price that. per meal. But it's yeah, the, the whole thing. The whole thing. Like yeah. go to a grocery store now, go buy your ingredients, figure it out. Dude, you may have some leftovers. Yeah, so it's crazy. It's like the difference is leftovers, but it's not packaged ready to it's go. It's crazy. It's right. crazy. So let's let's get back to what, what uh, the the tra the trail here. So 
you figured out the first year, you got it done. When do you do the rebrand? And when you do the rebrand again, do you staff to the projected business or are you, or are you grow, are you growing in size as you scale in sales? Cause this is something a lot of people struggle with and you obviously have scaled up very, very large. Right. Uh, option three is triage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, actually one, one thing we actually were horrible at and we still are, I guess, horrible at it is, uh, you know, guessing the market size. We didn't know how popular the model was going to be. And so when we kind of were first opening, we, we designed everything to say, okay, we're probably going to be averaging 30,000 meals a month. We think that's a, you know, about full market penetration for, you know, the meal prep industry. Um, and so we built a kitchen. So when we did the rebrand, we actually, that we kind of did that to coincide the store opening. Cause before we were just online, we would just deliver. And then when we opened the stores and we kind of did the rebrand, rebranded as foodie fit, opened the store and the delivery service kind of together in one, one big push. Um, and so we built the kitchen to only handle a eh, thousand meals a day, something like that. And by the time we got that going a few months into it, we'd <laughs> outgrown it. And, that uh, quick. yeah, it was, so, so we staffed up to, to do that, to do that. Well, real, real quick. When you, when you, when you, when you built the commissary, you have a commissary, right? You don't have kitchens in your stores. It's commissary. Well, the, the, so the first store actually had a ke- kitchen attached to it. Okay. Got it. Um, okay. Got and it. so, was, you know, the whole space, the whole unit was maybe 2,600 square feet. Was there, was there a chance to expand in that current space? So we actually knocked out the, uh, the office and expanded the kitchen. Got but it. by the time that construction project was done, we had basically outgrown already that. outgrown that. Well, this is, you know, again, here's another little fun lesson. Kids, if you're going to go rent commercial property, if you think your business may grow or you're looking at it to grow, always try to make sure that where you're buying, there's expansion plans. Because <laughs> otherwise, all the TIs that you spend to improve that space are going to go pretty much up in smoke, which is what happened to you guys. Um, here's a little fun tip I'll give you. If you're going to rent space, if there's an end cap and an, in, an infill piece, Always rent the end cap because the chances of you have the end cap of somebody's bringing the end, end piece are going to be pretty low. You can always grab it. Later. Man, it's really strange that he said that. Yeah. Is it? Is that what you did? Well, yeah. So we actually ended up. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, look at that. And most landlords won't Don't want that. you. They won't. Yeah. And it's called first right of refusal. Put yeah. that in your lease for yeah. sure. Yeah. So we actually yeah. ended up taking over the two units next to that store as well for our kind of corporate office space. Um, and so we, we were able to, to take over the majority of that, that building that we were in. Um, and we ended up uh, what, two years ago now is when we actually opened up our large commissary facility. Um, and I always said, oh, if we outgrow this commissary facility, like I, I probably won't. These are good problems. These are good yeah. problems. But, and, <laughs> wow. and now we're like approaching that because we built it to say, OK, we can do 10,000 meals in a day. And our, and our business <laughs> is very cyclical where, you know, everybody wants to come in on Sunday, Monday and, and load up for the week. So, you know, I think on this past Sunday, we are, you know, we did something like 6,700 meals, um, is what they had to cook, cook during that, their shift. And we're getting to a point now we're opening a third store, working on a third store, uh, Northwest. And by the time that one opens, we're basically going to be maxed out at our current facility again, again. So question, what is the, and I'm just curious, this is going to be like a nerd, <laughs> a nerd stat, but how many humans per, like how many meals per human? Like how many, like, for example, how many, when you're looking at hiring or staffing or expansion, how many humans do you need or for, to make a hundred meals? I mean, like, what do you need? Mm-hmm. So currently in our, in our kitchen, uh, the ratio is somewhere in around one human for every 150 to 200 meals. It actually really depends on the, on the menu. And so one of the things that's, um, so nice about, let's say like a Chipotle is it's really the same thing in just different that's variations different with us. We have 35 vastly different menu items, everything from Italian to classic American to Mexican. So the, the, you know, breadth of food that we cook, it's much more detailed and we do everything from scratch. So all the sauces are made in house. We grind our own meats, you know, so we, we like to make sure everything is as fresh as possible and gets to the customer. So it is pretty labor intensive. Um, and actually one of our kind of big initiatives right now is like, okay, what, what processes can we automate? And that's kind of the next big investment for us is how do we squeeze a little bit more production out of our current space? Yeah. (laughs) How do you handle it? So you're, you're making thousands and thousands of meals a day. How are you handling the logistics of getting them where they need to go? How are you handling that? So we do all, all of our uh, logistics in house. So we have, uh, as of right now, did you bring on, a, did you bring on a consultant or did you guys just figure this out? You, you guys yeah. built, um, an actual logistics program with like just all different types of technology. Involved. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we have this expression that I would say FIO figure it out. And so we uh, figured it out. So yeah, we didn't bring in a, an outside person. It was kind of just trial and error. Um, you know, constant reiteration of, of how the process should work. 
Um, and so, you know, currently we have, you know, on, on a busy day, we'll do something along the lines of maybe a little over 200 deliveries. So we deliver every day. Um, and so it was kind of just constant reiter re reiteration of how it should work. And that was kind of part of that first year mm -hmm. was we were delivering multiple times a day in the beginning to figure out when people actually wanted their delivery and how they wanted it. Um, so kind of going into scaling, we already had a lot of the answers of, of how, to, how it should work. Well, I mean, obviously with food being so expensive and it's so expensive right now, um, how do you forecast? How, I mean, what, what KPIs do you look for that really drive your purchasing decisions so you're not throwing thousands of dollars worth of food out in the trash every day? What, what, are you, what are you looking for there? How do you forecast? Yeah, so, it, you know, one of the nice things about scaling a food business is, um, you know, as your volume increases, you have more, more negotiating power yeah. with, with your vendors and things like that. And so we actually haven't had to increase pricing as fast as inflation because, you know, as prices increase, we go to our vendors and say, look, we used to do five, you know, 50,000 meals a month. Now we're doing a hundred change our cost, you know, our cost plus how, you know, or change this contract, how it's working. Uh, we hedged a lot of our costs during the, the, the lockdown. So we actually went to a lot of our vendors ordered, you know, pre-ordered, uh, you know, truckloads of containers, things like that, when stuff was next to nothing, because we knew eventually, you know, things were going to turn around. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we've been able to kind of offset a lot of that cost to the consumer uh, through just the increase in volume. And so, you know, kind of that economy of scale as you get busier, the more efficient you get. Uh, and, you know, so we revisit, you know, our food pricing all the time, but we actually kind of created a position who only manages inventory. So we have literally one person who just sits there all day and watches prices, orders, checks the pars. Um, and actually I wrote a SOP this morning on how do we refine you know, that process as well. Um, so we actually have one person that kind of just sits and watches that, that whole thing. All day long. Yeah. But I, I, would think you, I would think you'd be more concerned about, about orders to back it up because you, your stuff's fresh, right? You don't freeze anything. Right, right. I mean that, I mean... So we actually, Throw the way we can, that's, that's hard. So I actually, so in the stores, I actually built an algorithm that learns essentially buying habits and predicts the pars of what we should stock on the shelves of the grocery stores. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's, and it's, it's pretty accurate where we very rarely run out and we very rarely throw things out. Um, what, what are the strangest things that affect the algorithm? Uh, one offs when like one person comes in and buy and like buys out, you know, the entire shelf of one meal because they love it so much. They're going to bring it home and freeze it. Like that'll kind of throw off the numbers. Um, you know, but, but it's, it's an aggregated buying pattern over a few weeks and, and it has adjustments based on if we sell out of something or if, you know, we have too much of something. Um, so that, uh, that tells us what to stock on the shelves and they, the kitchen actually cooks overnight. So that way the, the stores are stocked with fresh meals every morning. Um, so that, you know, we're not trying to basically forecast too far ahead. We're trying to forecast essentially yeah, the next half day. The day ahead. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Are you, um, do your store send inventory? Well, you are obviously, you see what they buy through the computers cause you know, which mails got purchased, you know, what's gone. Mm -hmm. Uh, you do inventory, you do automated inventory management that way. Yes. We, we, it's actually really hard to do it with us because it's so cyclical. Yeah. Um, you know, we're on a, a Sunday and a Monday, for example, we'll sell three times as many meals on a Friday. And so, uh, it's just, it's just the cyclical nature of the business through the week. So, you know, we kind of have to really keep an eye on, on the pars and the, and the algorithm is basically just learning day by day. Uh, and, and so we don't actually have an automated inventory system because I, I built the program and did all the math for how yeah. the algorithm learns. Um, you know, as far as the inventory that's in the kitchen though, um, you know, what's nice is because we're so busy, our inventory turns are so fast that, you know, if I buy chicken, I know it's gonna be good for seven days. I order it every other day so as long as I can stock four days worth, I know I'll never run out and mm -hmm. I know I will, you know, never have to throw any out. Yep. I want to point something out for those of you who, like me right now who are listening to this. <laughs> if you are not someone that feels you can design an algorithm to track things in your business, there are plenty of consultants and plenty of people that can help you do this outside the math. You don't have to be Doogie Hauser here that can apparently figure all this shit out on his own. You don't Just have to pull that but together. But that's when I was talking about, so I know these, I know all of the owners when you talk about three people that got together and fill each other's gaps, yeah, it's, it's okay, one of the okay. funniest well, because, because when you look at it, Alex isn't sitting there running algorithms and crunching numbers <laughs> when I walk into the office or something. You know who is? He is. <laughs> when he said, "I'm an introvert. I like to like I like I yeah. want to own the process." Was it's that that's not that the things um, the the bloviation or the the hyperbole. It is 
literally what you were doing. Did you hear what he just did? Monday to Sunday. He went was, bloviation yeah, to hyperbole. Say, I mean, back to back. back. That was <laughs> back to back. Just that it's been quick. a while, actually. Oh, look how I mean, smart I, mean, I am. Bloviation, <laughs> hyperbole. <laughs> look how smart I am. No, but trying but, to compete now because the algorithm guy's <laughs> yeah. here. Oh. We <laughs> got us over but here. The day, though, it comes down. So there's successes, though, from an outsider's perspective. And partial, I've had inside glimpses yeah. become because there is somebody that has their nose to the grind and is doing the data and the hard work and the stuff that most sure. people don't want to do and is putting it on paper and is reviewing it and is writing at standard operating procedures and is reviewing resource man manuals for you know the human resource department and talking to different companies that is the absolute core and backbone of a successful company when you're scaling in my opinion i'm i'm one of those people that i understand it's cool to be flash and Get, you need both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's like, it's Alex is like, a, he's a brilliant like salesperson. And I always tell him like, he goes, well, I feel so bad. You work 90 hours a week. And like, I'm, you know, I, I just don't have that in me. I'm like, I don't need you to have that in you. Like just do the stuff that I don't want to go be the face, <laughs> yeah. go, go shake hands, kiss baby foreheads, do whatever you got to do. Yeah. And it's, and it's 90.15 hours a week. <laughs> at work. So let's be yeah. very clear. Let's not round that anywhere. You know, and, and <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah. He's like, actually, yeah, it's 90.15. <laughs> yeah. Six, six, yeah, seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't want to call it spade a spade, but there you go. Yeah, 90, yeah, yes. You but, know, and, and I, I hate cooking. And so, you know, Bo, you just cook. You just do you. And and let me be an introvert and crunch numbers because I'm a nerd and I love that stuff. Yeah. Um, and so the, the synergy is great. Partner you know? no. with people who are smarter than you kids or those who want to do the jobs you don't want to do. Yeah, that's, I mean, Bo's I never it. been happier in his whole life. I get it. So, so, so how, many employee, how many employees now? How many? Uh, so we, we're having trouble hiring. So we have one 105 that work for us. And then we actually just now have a temp agency that's helping us backfill positions. So, you know, kind of total on staff right now is 120. 120. Mm -hmm. How do you keep them motivated? How do you keep them happy? That's a lot of folks. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, you know, I, well, I think part of it is we have a core set of people who, you know, as a business grows, they see the growth and they want to be a part of that. And that's, and that's motivating in itself. But, you know, everyone talks about, you know, you have to build great culture and, you know, everyone is so stuck on like foosball tables and, uh, you know, beanbag chairs, like, dude, just treat people with respect. You know, like yeah. that, that's, that's all it takes is when they have an issue, listen and do, do your best to understand where they're coming from. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've been burned, man. I, you know, loaning money or, you know, helping someone move or, you know, like I've been burned so many times by staff, but in the end, like that's kind of just what it takes. Like they have to trust you and you have to trust them. Yeah. You just, you, you can't, you can't let the sins of others affect the relationships with all. I've, I've had, had that. I've had three or four clients that either worked for you at the time or then went and worked for you after they were my clients. And I've had them say, oh, I'm working for this great company. I'm like, oh, what is it? <laughs> like, oh, it's Foodie Fit. They make these meals. They're so wonderful, blah, blah, blah. So you get that organic, you know, um, sort of feedback. It's been pretty nice for me to hear because I, you know, I'm, I'm lucky I get to see them grow into what they're becoming. Can, can, I, can I ask an uncomfortable question? Because yeah. I'm just curious because your company has something that does kind of drive me crazy. And it's not your company specifically. It's not, your, it's just this thing that is, it is becoming very prevalent in a lot of businesses. Mm -hmm. The default tip me when you purchase something in a store. So this was actually a, can we a, talk about that yeah. on the point of sale? Yeah. When you go into the store and you grab your own food mm -hmm. and you walk it up just like you would at Walgreens or mm -hmm. Sprouts or anywhere else, they turn the screen on you. They turn it. So can you talk about that? It is an interesting question that I struggle with personally. Uh, yeah, we, well, we but, talk, we've talked about it on this show, and it's not a shot at mm -hmm. you. It's not a shot at Foodie Fit. It's just a question as to, from the business owner, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and so I I am, you know, one that is conservative by na by nature. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was kind of always, always my argument and was, well, this is a retail environment. This isn't like a normal, you know, tip environment. And so... The standard we have for customer service in our store, I believe, is probably, you know, one of the it's best great. in Vegas. It's great. Um, and, I, I, you know, anytime you go to the store, I, you know, we tell them is when people walk in the door, make them feel like they just won an award. Do whatever you can to delight them. Open the door. Carry, the, carry their, their groceries out. Shop for them. Like, do whatever you can. And we kind of have this metric where we say, okay, with every customer, you have to have a connection that isn't related to the food. Right? Start up a conversation. Right? And, and have that connection. And so we do have a kind of like default tip thing if you want. However, you know, it's not like 20, 25%, 30%. Yeah. You know, it's, it's more long. I think we have it set for like it, 
four percent or can can I can I ask a different question? Can I can I ask a different question based on what you just said though? Mm -hmm. You are a self proclaimed introvert. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're walking into your own store. Mm -hmm. Isn't that your worst nightmare? <laughs> I'm just, I'm and just, it's my Super Bowl. So. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, it's somebody's Super Bowl, but 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 as an introvert, is that like, dude? I just want to get my own basket. Yeah, I just want to pick up my food in peace. I don't want to talk about my life. I don't they're want, not overbearing because you usually have like no, but, pretty but, but, young, but, but, energetic. But, but, like, yeah, like no, no, they're gr they're gr they're yeah. great. Don't yeah. get me don't get me wrong. I have I have never been treated with anything but the utmost cheerfulness and respect when I've gone to your places, man. But I just I'm curious based on the what the experience you just described described. That would be a nightmare for you. Yeah, well, I, I, well, me, well, I think there's certain levels of introversion, right? Okay. So, like, like I just have a tank that will run empty if I spend too much time doing big social activities, right? So, you, you give me like a big dinner with a bunch of strangers, and I have to small talk the whole time, and it's you know not meaningful conversation. So this. <laughs> well, no, this, this, I got to talk about myself here. So okay, okay, that's yeah. true. That's a good thing. It is a buffet. <laughs> this is buffing my ego. It's great. Um, Gets to hang out with Chris. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Chris, Chris, by the way, is the most interesting man in the world. I, I swear to God. I, that's I was what I said. I thought he'd yeah. eat a human. He's that interesting. <laughs> Cole, there's a difference between eating a human and admitting you would eat a human on on, on a show that is, that yeah. could be used as evidence yeah. one what day. What he okay. does in his own personal time yeah. is we'll his talk business. Later. Yeah. Who he chooses to yeah. eat is up yeah. to him. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there's there's a difference it. between peeing in the pool and peeing, and peeing yeah. in the, the pool. pool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Shout out to Dimitri Martin. I, I, went, I went out to dinner the other night. You know what their auto gratuity was? Do you know how much it was? The auto gratuity yeah. was probably the default now. It's 23. 23. Autograt, huh? Yeah. Autograt. I was shocked at that. Yeah, I think that's... I worked in the service industry. You so worked in the service so industry. I. I, I love the service so industry. I, I always tip. I do, too. But 20% is fine. Like I said, I like the fact if you say, okay, 10% to the retail clerk, I'm thrilled if that was an option. We say 20%. I'm like, this is a weird type of inflationary activity, right? Yeah. Where you're now subsidizing people if they don't pay their employees well or if they don't treat them well. Yeah. Like you're going to this thing, well, I don't, I'm not going to pay them well. You pay them better. So it's a 20% inflation. It's a 20% tax. Yeah. Right. On a, on a, for a, for a retail without service. Yeah. That, that's asking for something you're not getting. So if you're serving somebody and you're doing something and it's really, charming person behind the counter and they're shopping with you and doing all this right. stuff well, well, then i have no problem hitting and, 15 20 hang on a second. and i will say this in, in the experience that you described is the experience you get when you walk in there they're like what do you like can i help you with anything so they are trying right. to go above and beyond and that was more of an of an I was, I was stores that you walk yeah, in and they're it like, was more, here's your, it's, here's it's your literally, food, yeah. yeah, it's like, literally yeah. nothing. No and service. they turn it's it around. Just, you know, what's worse like the charity donation. <laughs> Isn't charity terrible? Speaking of which, <laughs> oh, Foodie, Fit, Foodie Fit just dropped off 1,700 bags of school supplies, erasers, glue, pencils. I think I have a clap on yeah, this. Hold on. Give, give, them, give them some. Give us some. No, more. that's not it. That that's is not cult, it. That was absolutely horrifying. Music. That's the cult brain music. Foodie Sorry. Fit, they do this thing called uh, pack prep for school. Prep for school. With, yeah. the, with, with lower income neighborhoods. I love that. Awesome. Clark County. I love district. that. 1,700 so these kids come into their first day of school. And they have stuff. And they're walking, because you know a lot of times public, yeah, public school teachers tough. are subsidizing their tough. students. These guys, through their own efforts, and with uh, Justin Bloom of Bloom Fitness and with um, the Mike, uh, Michael Yeah, so we, 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 yeah, we have a few, few kind of sponsors that help us. Uh, Michael Sheedy Fitness, uh, Justin Sheedy. Blum um, from, from Raw Fitness, uh, you know, a bunch of other incredible sponsors. And we started off with just doing one school. So we kind of concentrate on, on uh, t Title One schools. I think yeah. Yeah. Um, and so this past year, it, you know, shout out to Alex Lee, my business partner, because he's kind of the, the spearhead of, of all this. Uh, and, you know, they were able to provide school supplies for every grade for three schools for love the that. entire school. I Unreal. love that. Unreal. You that, had to see that, the effort. That's, that's unbelievable. You know, it's funny. One of our agents, Ryan No, that works here um, at Simply Vegas, his team this weekend did something similar. <laughs> they donated... <laughs> it wasn't nearly that to that level. He's obviously his business is at your level, but they donated 250 backpacks, which I thought was amazing to a title one school. And I, I came and kind of came on where I celebrated him to the rest of the company. And I was like, look, th this is a lesson in life. If you want the community to be interested in you first become interested in the community, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's yeah. how to win friends and influence people at its greatest level through business. So I, I, yeah. I commend you to do that. I love, I love awesome. purpose driven yeah. businesses. I, I am a purpose driven business with my real estate stuff. I, I love that. I think it's amazing. They had so many people there packing bags. You, the community was involved because your business partner, all those people were saying, Hey, by the way, you're now doing this. 
you're now coming out and packing these schools mm -hmm. and different firms. Everyone's invest involved. And they had a, uh, a love Henry it. Ford era uh, <laughs> conveyor <laughs> belt of human beings <laughs> packing all these things for these kids, and it was yeah, just not, not, yeah, so it's not, not people you could eat. Yeah, it's not completely altruistic. Going. It's it's basically a, a way for us to try out new new uh, new Pena Cafe. What do you, what do you, so uh, so I'm curious about this. What do you do? So you have waste. You obviously have stuff that gets it's it's on the edge. You're getting rid of. Do you what do you do with it? So do you donate we, it? Do you we pitch actually it? have very little waste. Um, Good. Yeah. And so so part of it is you know we. We, because we know what the numbers are exactly what we're going to need for the following day, um, we, we cook to that. And then if it gets to the stores and it starts ex like getting close to expiration, so if it's on the shelf for more than two days, it gets discounted. Um, and, and then it gets picked up pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, we, we, we end up throwing out almost zero meals from the stores. And then as far as the stuff, you know, kind of in the kitchen that gets thrown out, it, it's, it's very minimal. little. It's yeah. minimal. So now, dude, you built this amazing business here in Vegas. So the plan now has got to be to grow this thing exponentially. World, how? To, give me the plan for worldwide domination. Let's hear what it is. So uh, the next step for us is kind of focusing on technology. I and mean, we focus on a lot of technology in the cooking aspects. We have like self-cooking ovens, right? So Bo will go in our kitchen at our headquarters. We'll say, all right, for this dish, I need this cooked, you know, the steak cooked, uh, medium rare, but charred on the outside, blah, 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 blah. And the ovens uh, essentially have, you know, can sense the temperature of the product, the condition. It can change the humidity, temperature. The giant Brava. <laughs> yeah. Like I have a Brava at my house. Same right. thing, but in giant. All right. So, so he programs that. It uploads it to the cloud. And then all the ovens in the network know how to cook that thing. And so, you know, the next kind of step for us is on the packaging side. So we're actually working with a food scientist right now. Okay. okay, okay. To extend the I, for stop. one, welcome so, our stop alien Stop for a second. Stop for a second. Yes. Stop for a second. imagine doing well, no, no. this 20 years well, ago. Well, hang on. Stop, stop for a second. So. Ago. You guys made a considerable investment in equipment. I mean, mm -hmm. monstrous. Is that something you guys were able to finance? Is that something you were leasing? Is yeah. that something that you have purchased? Finance. So we, we took advantage in 2020 when the market took a dump and then basically they were handing out free money. Yeah. Um, you know, so for, for a business that didn't have incredible revenue to go get, you know, a few million dollars at 3% is historically unheard of. Yeah. And so, yeah, we, we, we took advantage of that and we ended up actually buying a kind of dilapidated building um, that used to be a USDA kitchen. Uh, it had been, been abandoned for a little bit. So we basically went and got a loan, stripped the whole building, built it to use, um, you know, specifically for our business. And, and so it's, it's served us well because we, we got to basically design it from the ground up exactly how we needed to operate our business. Awesome. So doing the worldwide expansion, is this something, are you going to go the, the Canes route where you're going to do them all yourself? Or are you going to try to franchise them out? What's the plan? Yeah. So, you know, uh, Alex, my business partner, actually is in pretty close contact with Andrew Chung, who's the founder of Panda Express. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always had this dream, like, oh, like how cool would that be to go public? Though it's probably not a great idea because you obviously have shareholders and people get upset when you don't make earnings, like win oh. over here. No, the worst, um, thing, the worst thing you can do as a public company right. is make money. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your valuation as a startup. You yeah. start turning a profit. Now you got to multiply. I mean, you don't want to do that. Um, but you know, it, it's it's kind of one of those things where we know that the the food is at the core of the business, and we need to do what we can to to control the food. And that was, you know, one of the good lessons that we learned from, from Andrew at Panda Express was, you know, keep that stuff in house. And so, you know, our, our kind of plan now is to totally capitalize full market penetration here in Vegas. Uh, we think we can basically reach that ceiling by the end of next year. And then 2024 start expanding into new, to new markets. Are you going to try to, I mean, you're going to open up obviously new kitchens in those markets. Are you going to try to ship food from here there? We don't so, know. so we so we actually so <laughs> investors we'll, maybe we'll, yeah. you <laughs> so we'll probably need investment um but actually one thing we just did is you know is we, we knew this next phase is kind of outside of our of our expertise and so um we we did some restructuring and so we used to kind of have this equal partnership and we knew in order to drive the company in one direction we were going to have to kind of change some stuff so bo and alex had basically moved me into to more of like a ceo role essentially with the kind of caveat knowing that I've never done this role before. And so we actually hired a CEO coach slash business advisor who used to be an executive for Tyson Foods, uh, had his own food startup, ended up uh, exiting, uh, selling it for, you know, 300 million, something along those lines. Um, and so, you know, we actually brought him on. We've been working with him now for a couple months and he's going to really help us, you know, drive this model forward because this is something he's already done. Sure. And it's easy to you know success, just follow success is an yeah. easy way to do it. Has anybody come with a check yet for you? Is it maybe looking to buy it? Uh, we get probably investment opportunities 
once a week offers, you know, people coming in. Um, but we just don't have a, an efficient way to, to deploy capital yet because the model still isn't hundred percent done. Got it. And so we, we think by the end of next year, we'll, we'll have a firm understanding of how we need to grow moving forward, whether it's shipping meals or moving to, uh, you know, modified Regional packaging or yeah. yeah. So, um, we think by the end of next year, we'll probably start needing to looking for outside investment to kind of reach our ambitious goals, if you will. Well, brother, when you get there, man, I'll, I'll, hopefully I'll be one of your first calls because I, I love the product. I think it's a great business. And obviously, you know, you guys got it down, counting down, Pat, which is amazing. Yeah, it's, 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 it's been fun. It's been a journey. Let me, let me tell you. Well, <laughs> well this, has been, this has been an absolute master class in how to build and scale a business. And I, and I, and I love it. It's, it's, it's so interesting. But you know what else is interesting? The mind of Colt. This now is actually why I'm here. Yes, now it's time <laughs> for a trip into back. the mind of Colt. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Tripping in the mind. Five questions. I'm what for you guys think of me that theme music. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's I'm absolutely be no, no. like so, I, so if you're just listening, it's okay. something new that we're Hunting doing. Human beings. Yeah. So, somebody <laughs> gave somebody gave me these. They're they're uh, guaranteed fresh pod decks, interview decks, and uh, they're questions you can ask if you have a podcast. And I just find them entertaining. And rather than ask people to come in, we just ask Colt because I figure his answers are probably going to be stranger and more interesting. Is so, Colt, are you prepared for question number one? <laughs> I really thought you guys had theme mu music that was no, no just for you. Happy? Why can't no. we? Be friends. Yeah. Like and we can add, we'll energy, add that. I, the actually, energy but, if we, I, but if we see the problem is if we add that, then we'll get pegged for having copyright material. Yeah, we're gonna yeah, drop yeah. down and get to that. So, so yeah. First question. You ready, Colt? Here it comes. If you could hire any wedding singer, who would you choose and what song? Weddings Tony Bennett. To sing what song? Uh The Way You Look Tonight. Okay. Fair. Oh. Then it'd be Shakira. I, you know, I'm going to say that you mean while she's so in jail hard. in Spain. <laughs> if you could try out, who would? Why would you cheat on Shakira? You mean the tax man? No, I'm talking about her ex man. Because <laughs> have you heard her voice? Wait, <laughs> what Shakira? You do not Here's talk my for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> you do not <laughs> talk bad. <laughs> wow. No, Shakira is a freaking icon. Keep her name out of her, your oh, mouth. Oh boy. Well, okay. Well, you can, here comes the next one. You ready? If you could try out a job for a day just to see if you like it, which job would you choose? Uh, trial attorney. <laughs> trial attorney. <laughs> feel like I'd be a great trial attorney. <laughs> like you'd be a no, you're a fucking liar, <laughs> yeah, man. That's what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> can you curse? Like you'll no, get, you'll, no, the judge will yell at you. Decorum right? is, is expected. Yeah, yeah. I think curse? you should be able to curse. I thought for sure you say Shakira's uh, massage. <laughs> yeah. <It's> just, <laughs> I think you just want to go in and go, aha, in those moments. <laughs> Not Shakira's masseuse like yeah, Andrew said. I would. <laughs> You'd rather be a trial attorney. Yeah, it would okay. be. Oh, I think I'd be a good trial attorney, yelling at people. Not a cupcake tester or something. Or, yeah, yeah, no, that. No. Trial attorney. No. Human trial. flesh chef. You don't want to try that for a day? Nothing I'm telling you, I'm, there's got to be a documentary about that. <laughs> Bobby <Yeah>. Flay. <laughs> What is I the don't like Bobby Flay because of, uh, <laughs> what was he, uh, what was he on Entourage? Oh, yeah. Because right. he's not yeah. trash. He did too good of a job acting. Don't like him anymore. Yeah, that's What? Him and Tom Hanks, huh? God, that's Tom it? Hanks. Okay, God. we'll get started. What is the nicest thing a stranger has ever done for you? Uh, it's a story about being having his life saved by that angel. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we tell the angels, I was going it. to say, that's, I was, that's the I was answer, going to say, a lady came up and gave me a hug once. That was super nice. But, yeah, the angel. I Save mean, I don't you. think it's a... That's not a human being, but I'll talk. I'll talk. <laughs> okay, the angel saving me. Yeah, all right. He just came into right. form of a human, <laughs> form six of foot one, six one eighty, one eighty, blue eyes, incredibly blue specific, eyes, gorgeous. incredibly specific white, stats, white hair, for five year olds, <laughs> incredibly specific. I think he had a uh, uh, some khakis on. <laughs> okay, six pack abs. <laughs> if you were in charge, what three items would you put in the office vending machine? I already know one of them. Oh, scotch, cigars, <laughs> and um, scot <laughs> scotch, scotch, cigars, cigars, more cigars, <laughs> burritos, Bur burritos. burritos. So I can see it now. Somebody comes in the office, right, to, to talk about buying a house. They got a kid. Oh, Dad, can I go to the vending machine? They come back with a glass of scotch, a cigar, and a burrito. Do you think your kids would be better if they had a, just a taste of scotch every day? <laughs> yeah, man. 
feel like they grow up. Then they could go and do 14 year old jobs like you're doing. They had <laughs> scotch. They don't drink enough. That's the problem. You know what I found? In actual in a grocery store or no in a uh, the views convenience of cold store. Do not <laughs> they never a do. convenience store in the middle of Utah. They had the uh, smoking um, the fake cigarettes. The fake cigarettes. The Popeyes. Know. When How men awesome were men. were those? When men were men, the candy yeah. cigarettes. That would puff out. I, yeah. I was up to a pack a day on those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. God, we have Didn't get lung cancer. I got type 2 diabetes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a country. You can't get cancer, but diabetes is on the way. That's yeah. it. All right, last question, Colt. If you could bankrupt one person or company, who oh, would it be? Easy. Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks. <laughs> that's not even a question. <laughs> I get two for him oh, and his wife and, and his that, kid. And for that, That's we will three. leave you. God, oh you my guys, God. I have good dreams tonight. If you're, that. if you're still watching this for some reason <laughs> somehow on YouTube, please make sure you like and subscribe. And if you're listening to us on whatever podcast service you are, make sure you give us the maximum amount of stars. We're just going with that. And again, the thoughts and feelings of Cold Amadan do not reflect the thoughts. Andrew, you like Tom Hanks. And the rest of the power move. I feel like you like Tom You don't Hanks. have to answer All that resemblances question. of persons <laughs> really. <laughs> Tom who? Strictly for the purpose of the show. Exactly. And do not resemble anybody in real life. No, they do not. They do not. <laughs> and Tom Hanks fan? Oh, oh, God. I need to answer. Do not you answer know. this question. Tom, Tom who? Oh, yeah, okay, there you go. Come on. Exactly right. So smart. Oh, Jesus. Guys, remember, if you're going to move, move forward. God, we Andrew. should. Do you know what? <laughs> Vending machine. <laughs> Of scotch and cigars. <laughs> hey, it's John Gafford. If you want to catch up more and see what we're doing, you can always go to thejohngafford.com, where we'll share any links that we've things we talked about on the show, as well as links to the YouTube where you can watch us live. And if you want to catch up with me on Instagram, you can always follow me at thejohngafford. I'm here. Give me a shout.